So welcome to Robotics 102, Introduction to ARM Programming. I'm Professor Chad Jenkins. Um, and today's lecture is going to get you prepared for project two, where we're going to discuss where we're going to discuss bug algorithms, which is going to be a way to take your wall follower and extend it out to uh, to do to do autonomous navigation, goal directed autonomous navigation to a to a given point. And so we're going to that this is what we're going to cover today. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about where we stand in the class uh, moving forward. But uh, but I'm just going to if there's no questions, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so, just as a recap, our uh, for our for the for our goal in the class overall is that we want to basically give you the power of autonomous navigation. And so, what that means is that we, if we have a robot that starts at any point, uh, any point A, an arbitrary point in the world, it should be able to get to a given goal location that we that we give to the robot. We say you want to go here. And it should be able to do that autonomously and without having without having collisions. And so this is really getting a robot to go autonomously from point A to point B is really where we'd like to be able to get uh, get you in the, in this class. And so uh, so when we're thinking about what we want to what we want to accomplish for uh, for 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 this, we really have to think about our our inputs as some arbitrary start location. And an arbitrary goal location that's going to be given to us by by a user. And so, what we're going to do, we're going to explore a couple of ways to, to think about how we do this problem. Um, but we're going to start by thinking about it from the perspective of a bug. And so, uh, so I have our our friend the cockroach here. Has anybody ever seen how a cockroach moves around and 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 does things? How it navigates on its own? So I found this video online. <laughs> Nobody likes roaches. We can get a pet roach for the class. <laughs> Um, it moves. Check this out. Look at this. Look at this autonomous behavior. I mean, you think about it. You know, it's actually you know this robot. Uh, I mean, this uh, this bug moves better than some robots, right? <laughs> you got to imagine. You know, what kind of smarts do you have in this uh, in this robot uh, in this in this bug that's just you know with with very you know very low cost, small platform is able to move around autonomously, pretty robustly. Um, and, 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 uh, and so, so, you know, so what, so a question would be, how does this, how does this actually work? What insights can we take from nature? Um, <laughs> all right. gets a little interesting from there. Uh, but what does a bug need to, to navigate it constantly? Any, 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 what does the bug need? Yeah. Right. So it's gotta, it's gotta be able to sense the world, right. Get, take feedback, know where it's going. Um, I'd like to hone that into it's, it's got to know where it is R roughly has to know sort of where it is in space, but it also has to react to the obstacles that it's going to, that it's going to have anything else that a, a bug might need to navigate autonomously. No roach experts here. <laughs> well, look, how about this? Let me rephrase the phrase, re rephrase the question. Oh, actually it's not, I'm, if you're, if you're, if you're worried about just being bugs, uh, you know, so I also found, uh, I also found, oh, Delan said legs. Delan, you can unmute and, and chime in. So if you want to, but I appreciate the chat. So it needs legs. <laughs> you have to have actuators to move around. Um, but not, it's not only just, just bugs. So I found this one too. This is a gerbil. Um, somebody put their, their pet gerbil into a, into a maze and is trying to get them to, trying to get the, the gerbil to, um, to, uh, to to um to to navigate the maze uh, properly, and so you can see the gerbil's moving around. And it's doing all sorts of stuff. It's you know it's actually doing a pretty good job of not bumping into the walls, right? Although they had to, if you saw the the sign, they had to put the the glass on so the so the so the um so the gerbil didn't didn't just hop over the walls, right? Um, but you know, but but you know, but this is sort of what our what our robots are. Um, you know, this is kind of behavior that we we kind of like to have from our robots to be able to explore space. And navigate uh, navigate autonomously. Um, so you know it's going to take the. Should we should we watch the gerbil finish? <laughs> I'm 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 in suspense. Is the gerbil going to make it out of the maze? I don't I don't know. I'm oh, still searching. Did a little backtracking, right? Um, still going there. We go. But it's pretty. You know, I I think it's pretty cool that uh, that the. That you know, like we we would want to have our robots be able to be this robust and move around. This this gerbil is breaking my heart. <laughs> Come on, gerbil! I know you can do it. 
Oh, there it goes. And it finally, it finally made it, made it out. So only, only took dribble about a, a minute 46, right? Um, but that was the dribble's first try. Didn't know anything about the environment um, and it moved around. So if we think about the same things that the, that, you know, that our robot needs, it's the same, it's very similar to what the cockroach needs or the dribble needs to be able to move around. And so, um, so for thinking about it from that perspective, how is our robot like like the bug, right? What are the things that our robot has that or or the or the dribble that our, our robot has that will allow it to to navigate autonomously? I'm thinking of two things. What do you what do you think I'm thinking of? What is our what does our robot have that uh, that's also needed by the bug? You know what you already answered one question. No, somebody else. There's no wrong answers. I'm not grading this, so <laughs> You can speak up. I'm grading you if you don't if you don't have an answer for me. A way to, to self-position and know where it is in space, definitely. That's one. You got a good answer on the family feud. People know what that is. Yes, over there. Uh, one can know how to react according to different situations, so you have different stages. Right. Uh, so, so we have to have a controller that's on that's on the program. So we have to have that as well. That wasn't one of the two that I was thinking of, but now that you say it, I should have thought of that. That was that was a that was something that we that I should have done. Um, anybody else? So we need a controller. We need to know what we call localization, so where the robot is in space. Any other any other things? Yeah. Right. So we have to our, we have to have some sort of computation so that our controller can run on that platform. I like that. I like that. Yes, in the back. An encoder on the wheels. So that's that that's so that's going to allow us to have odometry, which is going to allow us to localize the robot and know where it is in space. I'm thinking of one more thing that's on this bug that we haven't talked about yet. So look at the bug. We've talked about the legs. We've talked about the brain. We've talked about the robot's sort of odometry and ego motion. Um, what, what's, sensors. what's that? Sensors, like his antennas, like the LiDAR. You could relate the LiDAR to his perfect. antennas. Exactly. Perfect. And so I will I will show you the two things that I came up with. So the land's correct. So that we, you know, we have the antenna of the of the of the cockroach of the bug um, represents its, uh, its, its, its range finding. It's similar to, you can think of the laser range finder as antenna that the, that the robot casts out to, uh, to, be able to, see, to, to be able to see where things are in space, almost touch things, touch objects in space. And odometry gives us, so the same way that we have odometry on the wheels, that gives our robot a sense of what we call proprioception, right? That's what the, what the body can sense about its own motion in the world or, or the robot's own sensing. As people mentioned, we do have to have computation on board and we have, do have to have a controller as well. And so these are, these are some of the things. So our, our robot can be very, can, we can very much cast it to like what, how a bug would, 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 um, would move around space. And so that's sort of what we're gonna, what we're gonna talk about for project four, but I, but, but, until, but, but I also wanna give a, a recap of where we've, where we've come to up to this point that's gonna help us with project two. So just as a reminder, our goal is to be able to understand foundational AI algorithms and be able to implement and implement those algorithms in code to control robots. And so we're gonna we're gonna work all the way out. We've gotten through the project through projects one and zero for wall following and the calculator. Our next project that you're working on right now is the bug algorithm. We're gonna extend that out. We're gonna to do a full uh, what we call optimal shortest path. Uh, pathfinder for using breath, the breath first search algorithm. And then we're going to use the camera on your robots to do neural networks, to do image classification um, that will allow our robot to, to be able to move around space, what we call in a manner that we call semantic, uh, semantically. So we'll do some sort of semantic mapping there. Um, so just to, as a recap of where we stand. Uh, so we have, uh, so for project zero, we, we have gone through all the things that you need in order to do, in order, all the basics of, of C++. Um, and so we can check off all of those things. We've, we've, done, we've done each of those and we've implemented a project calculator. If you implement the project calculator, 
at the at sort of the the base basic level, then you know we're moving along, and you have basic fluency in C plus plus. If you did the extra extensions, then I'm I'm feeling good about that because I went way too fast in terms of covering structs and, and things and uh, and a number of other features of of the language. But if you can do it, then I'm feeling good about uh, your future as a coder. Um, just. Also, in addition to knowing C++ and how to code, we also want to understand the foundational uh, AI algorithms as graph and graph algorithms. And so a graph, if you, if, if, you, if you remember sort of me talking about this earlier, is not pixels on a screen. You kind of think of graphics as sort of like, as uh, you know, we kind of confuse graphs and graphics, right? Graphics is little pixels on the screen and doing things like that. Uh, instead, what a, what a graph is, is a graph is a collection. We can think of these as a collection of nodes um, that are connected together by edges. So if you're looking in this picture right here, um, uh, you know, each of these circles represents a node and then it has co connections to uh, using edges to other nodes. And so this graph representation is really one of the fundamental uh, representations we have in, uh, in, in, in mathematics, but also used throughout computer science. And that, that gives us a, a certain abstraction that allows us to do uh, various modeling and, um, and analysis of, of the types of computation that we do. Um, in particular, one of, the, one of the things that we do is we, we, we represent computation using a graph through something we call a finite state automata. And so if we think about what our uh, so a finite state automata is essentially they can represent using use the graph to represent a computing process or some sort of control process in graphical form. Um, and what we have right here is is uh, is, is um, finite state automata. We usually express it as what we call a finite state machine. And so what we're seeing right here is actually the finite state machine for our for our pocket calculator. And so, uh, so I just want to walk, walk through what, what, what this looks like, just so you understand, just so we have a clear understanding of what a finite state machine is. So if we look at the behavior of our, of our pocket calculator and how, it's, how it performs, um, what, we, what we do is it, 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 that really describes our, our program without necessarily having to write code. And so if we look at the first thing that our, our program does, got to put my glasses on for this one it's gonna get the first number. And so that, that state of the graph represents the thing that we're gonna do at this time. We're gonna get that first number. And then once we get that first number, we transition to get operator. So then we're gonna get an operator, that's our next state. The arrows basically tell us that we should now do, do a get next number. And then we're gonna get the next number from, from, our, from the user. That's gonna be what we, what we do. Once we have those, we can compute the result and output it to the screen. And that is the first, uh, first computation that our calculator does. Once we do that, we loop back around and, uh, and we're, gonna, we're, gonna, gonna ask the, we're gonna then get the next operator from the user. And so we can, um, so the operator, so the, the user gives us a plus as the operator. Then we can get the next number and we can just follow along in the finite state machine for how, for what, how our program should operate at this, at this point. So I don't even have to write any code I just have to follow along in the graphical form of, of what the finite state machine is doing. And that's telling me the behavior of our, of, our, um, of, our, of our program. And so I'm just clicking through this so you can see how it runs. I hope this, uh, this makes sense. Um, you'll see finite state machines all throughout computing and robotics. So this is a pretty fundamental thing. It's, a, it's an abstraction that we, that we use uh, very frequently. Um, and so as we get to there, we, we get to a certain point and, uh, and our user is in, in, has input a number of operators and we've performed a number of operations, but then we get a queue, right? Which is one of our operations too. Um, that means we, you know, so once we get the queue operator, what should our program do? I'm missing one state here. What's a, what's the state of my state machine that I need to add? No, you can't. You can't. You can't. What, do I need to put a cockroach on to get a to get a response? <laughs> Anybody? Yes, in the back. It should quit exactly. So that would be. So now we have an end program state, right? And so from that end program state, we can uh, we can you know that that essentially describes our the behavior of our of our program. Um, and so you know, so I think you're probably saying this is pretty simple. Like, who cares? <laughs> why, why do we care about a finite state machine? What's what's uh, what's so important about it? Um, just a show of show of just a show of hands. Who doesn't care about a finite state machine? All right, I'm going to try to make it my mission to convince you to care about finite state machines. All right. um, my ego is still intact. Uh, 
So well, the way one reason why why finite state machines are important is in artificial intelligence. Uh, there's there's the there's the notion of what's called the levels of analyses, and so this came from a guy from from a, a famous neuroscientist called named David Marr. Um, anybody, any if you went go to some of the big computer vision conferences, uh, I think it's I, I forgot if it's ECCV or I, ICCV. These are two two of the major vision conferences. The best paper prize uh, at the at this conference is named after David Marr. It's the Marr Prize, um, and so Marr is really you know he really laid a lot of the foundations of computer vision. Uh, but one thing that he 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 gave to us that was really cool is he gave us the three levels of analyses when you think about computation. And so there's the comp there's the computational level, which is really just about describing your problem. It does not tell you how to so how to solve a problem. It only really tells you how to you know what are the inputs into your into your um in, into your what, how do, when you're describing your problem, what are the inputs that you're given, the things that that you have. What are the outputs that you're trying to infer and induce and, 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 and trying to infer and or, or deduce? And then are there any constraints that you have to deal with between these between these these inputs and outputs or any anything that's gonna that's gonna affect um, how you know how you have to what, what's the quality of the type of solution that you have to have? And so this doesn't talk about anything uh, about how you do it. It just about it's really just what is your problem? Inputs, outputs, and any constraints. Right. Um, if you're looking in, in certain, your your um, you know, oftentimes if you ever hear hear the term probabilistic graphical model, or you see some neural network that's that's uh, that's abstracted, you know, that really is sort of a, a, a computational level uh, level description. Once you have the computational level description of your problem, then you can think about things at the algorithmic level, and these are the particular steps that you can that you're the, the particular steps that you would have to that you'd have to um. The, the particular steps of the solution to a, to to the problem or to a solution or to the problem and so really that starts to get to how are you going to start to represent your solution how do you represent how do you represent your inputs and your outputs and then how do you represent all the intermediate steps that you have to do all the transforms on your data step by step to get to the to to get to transform your inputs into your outputs really this starts to become what is the recipe for how you for how you solve the problem and then, if you then once you have an algorithm, once you have something at the algorithm, well, at, at the algorithmic level, then you have the implementation level, and then that's the specific system that you've created to execute the solution. And so then you have to think about, you know, what machine would or would you are you going to implement your solution on? Is it going to be, you know, is it going to be a computer? What kind of digital computer is it going to be? Something that has GPUs, just going to be a straight, you know, CPU implementation? Or are you going to use an old 486? Anybody heard of a 486 before? That was what that was computer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a really old Intel chip. So when I was in when I was in college and I was playing and I was playing uh, Network Doom, we used 486s. And when the Pentium chip came out, it was a revelation. It's like, wow, we can we can compute at 90 hertz. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or 90, 90, uh, 90 kilohertz or something like that. I'm sorry. Uh, I should I should I should try to recall tech specs. But it could be a computer, but it could also be a physical machine, right? It you know you could have a mechanical system that could solve your problem. If you're working in you know your standard calculus class, you're the machine who has to do it. You have to do it pencil and paper, and so that you know so you might generate the same solution as a computer, but you're a different machine that's producing it. If you're using a computer, what programming language are you using? Going to use C plus plus, Python, Fortran, COBOL. Uh, I'm dig me out of this hole now. I'm not going to. I'm going to say more more antiquated languages. Uh, JavaScript. I'm a big JavaScript person. I love JavaScript. Nobody, not many people agree with me, but I love HTML5 and JavaScript. I can do all. I can, the, the, the different programming languages can solve can implement the same algorithm to solve solve the, the problem, but with different pros and cons on the, on the performance. And then also, who who implemented that system? So you can you can implement one of the algorithm, and I can implement implement an algorithm. Our algorithms, our implementations may look different, but we may be able to have perhaps have, have that same code. And so that's that's what this looks like. That's this is sort of why we think about things at these different levels. So to cast this in terms of in terms of what we're going to to accomplish uh, for project two, what we're doing throughout the course is we're thinking about autonomous navigation. That is the problem that we're that we're doing. Our input is we're going to give a goal location. And we're going to output control commands that, that navigate our robot to the goal. And one of the constraints we have is to avoid collisions. So that is, we can have many different algorithms that would solve this problem. It could be A star pathfinding, breath first search, 
uh, potential field system, uh, bug algorithm. There's many that could do that. But for uh, but but for um, for 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 um, for this next project, you're going to specifically implement a bug algorithm. I should actually say this is going to be a bug zero algorithm. I'll talk about that later. But in that in 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 the, at this algorithmic level, we're gonna you're going to be given a goal as a vector, a two-dimensional vector with an X and Y location. And at every moment in time, you're gonna, you're gonna send drive commands and that's gonna be sort of a three vector that you have. So this is gonna be controls in U, uh, in X, Y, and, and the turning in theta. And we're gonna describe that process as a finite state machine. And then once we, so I'm gonna talk about what the bug algorithm looks like as a finite state machine. And then your implementation, your project two implementation is gonna be on a, on a, your machine is gonna be an MBOT robot with running a Raspberry Pi running C++ code, right? But it could be, you know, you could implement your, 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 uh, your control, this controller, this bug algorithm on a iRobot create running, uh, running uh, running Python code, or it could be an old shaky SRI robot running Fortran code. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. But also we're gonna have different implementations in this class. And so it'll be, so your implementation will be specific to your team and it'll probably have pros and cons with it as well. And so this is kind of why we think about things in this abstract and in this sort of abstract way. And so, you know, so that really, you know, so, so that recap sort of, sort of goes over finite state machines and which was one of the main things we should take away from project zero. Um, but I also wanna, wanna say that we've, uh, we've covered wall following as well. So that was project one. And so if we do our checklist for this, we implement a number of great things for this. We implemented bang bang controller, we implemented fine min dist, we converted polar to Cartesian, we implement a cross product, and if you didn't implement a cross product, you didn't get all full, all, all, all the points for the project. Uh, we did a vector sum. Uh, there's one thing that we didn't talk about though, which is how to how to address noise. And so, um, so sometimes we get we get uh, we get feedback like this that uh, that somebody will say, you know, our robot is is uh, is not able to to round corners. And we get this behavior where it's trying to get stuck and goes around and over and over and over again. Um, and you know, this happens because 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 really. Um, one thing that we should we should note is that your wall follower is not going to be perfect. You're good, if you you may have noise that you have to deal with in your in the in that that uh, that your robot may have to face from the from the sensors or from the actuators. Noise is just a part of the real world, and so we're going to try to make it perfect. But it's not. It's, but we we may have it may just be very good sometimes depending on our circumstance. Um, one thing we didn't talk about, but if you want to chat with me about it, is that you can there's there's a ways to filter your your um some of your data, and that's one way to deal with noise. There are many different ways to filter um, noise, in, in this particular case was due to outlier readings that we were getting from uh, from some of the um, from some of the from from the laser rangefinder, um, and so one one thing you do is keep a running average on robot direction. So if you get an outlier response, it just kind of averages out. Um, I just want to say this as one possible way for dealing with this, but there there's a whole range of things we can do. And if you're interested in studying this more, there's a number of great classes that you can take as follow up. Robotics 330. Um, we're going to have a probabilistic robotics course, which is currently robotics 530. If you want to, if you want to go out that that far, but that can be that is part of our curriculum. But this starts to get to one one. If we just assume that our wallflower is good, we can start to extend our wallflower out to what's what's called a bug algorithm, and so uh, so we'll talk about how we do that. But really, I think the question I would ask you is, if we took our wallflower right now. Could it navigate to a goal location? We say, go to this goal location. Will the robot get there? How many people think the robot will get there? How many think the robot won't get there? How many people aren't voting? <laughs> we go. See, that's that's the wrong answer. That was the only wrong answer. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I will say. By the way, go out and vote. I just want to say that, um, but um, but probably not. But it's not necessarily sure that it that, that you know. But it could happen. So if you're if you send your robot out, let's say we have an arbitrary location on, we put a robot on the second floor of the building, and we put our robot down. And we we want the robot to get to a goal location. It's going to start going around the building on its own, um, and if it, it could by chance happen to get to a particular location, it's not going to stop, but it could get to that location. But without some sort of a purposeful way of thinking about how it's going to get to that location and stop, it's probably not going to get to our to our goal and do what we want it to do. So, where what options do we have for navigating our robot? Yeah, your question. Answer your question. 
Okay, answer what's 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 the question? Or no, what's what's your answer? Sorry. Um doing this Zoom using the high state team where you use wall calling when they're not open up May. Can you um vote when there is no opportunity to Great. You've developed you've you have developed a bug algorithm. Now I'm gonna help you express as a finite state machine. So so yay, you're already ahead of the Justin. <laughs> but what's the here's here's a question. What's the simplest way that we could get our robot to navigate to a goal? Simplest algorithm. I'm gonna get a question back for you. <laughs> Does somebody have yeah, Julius? What's that? So what kind of drive command do we send? So how do, if we send a drive command, what, so so we the drive command will be the output, but what what algorithm will we generate, will we use to generate that drive command? Simplest algorithm that can get our robot to a goal that would produce drive commands. We could, even simpler than that. Yeah. Uh, even simpler than that. Sorry? Uh, even simpler than that. Simplest possible possible algorithm. Even simpler than that. Even simpler than that. What's that? We're not getting anywhere. Well, that's the more simple than I was hoping for. But, uh, but, uh, but actually, the simplest way is just move randomly. So like, you know, so why, you know, why do, if we don't have to compute anything, we just bounce around, right? We could do that. Anybody know what that called from high school physics? Does anybody know what this is called? Didn't you guys just were in high school physics? <laughs> What's that? What's that? I, I didn't hear it. What, what, what was the simplest, what, what do we, in high school physics, what do they call just moving around randomly? Yeah. It's what? Uh, <laughs> simply for that. Well, you know, you can minimize entropy entropy by doing that. Yeah. Guessing. Guessing is. I was thinking for a physics term. Anybody have a physics term? What's? Uh, that's the third derivative. No, no third derivative. Drew. Okay. How about how about this? Maybe maybe they don't cover. I'm old, so they covered it when I was in high school. Uh, it's called. Oh, I'm sorry. Random walk algorithm. I'm sorry. I'm going to skip that. Um, it's called Brownian motion. You ever heard of Brownian motion? Never heard of Brownian motion. So so the, the there's hypothesis that you know that the particles you know there's actual intelligent behavior that comes from from uh, from you know from particles that move around, but they just bounce around randomly. But from that self, you know, um, intelligent behavior just kind of self organizes. And so, what Brownian motion sort of does? Imagine this is a particle on a on a on a in a two D space. Um, your Brownian motion is just this particle moving around in sort of a random way. And you know, and you, we see Brownian motion all throughout nature. Random random walks, random behavior is uh, is all throughout uh, is all throughout our our um, uh, all throughout the the systems that we that we see in the natural world. And so this is just a, a 2D particle moving around moving around space randomly. And this is this is our random walk. If we looked at the finite state machine for what this what this uh, for what this would do, is we just the simplest thing we do pick a random direction send a drive command in that random direction. And you do that over and over and over and over and over. You don't even stop, you just keep going. And that's it, that's the simplest thing you can do. Um, so with that, a robot that moves around randomly. Any guesses of a robot that might do something Brownian motion-like that you would see all, ar all around? Any thoughts? You can answer this one if you want. <laughs> do you want a hint? Or do you want me to leave you in suspense? Yeah. It's a specific robot that you can buy. We could go out and buy one of these right now, yeah. Sort of, sort of like this? So if I put like a, so maybe what I could do is I could take a, I could take like a, a like just a little light, like an LED light, and uh, and put it on the robot and have it move around, and then just and then just have a time lapse camera that would just 
see and just put compose one image of like the trajectory of the robot. And so this is this is what that was it. Would you say a Roomba? Exactly. So you know, so we could you could go out and buy one of these right now for somewhere between I think one hundred fifty to to five hundred dollars. Maybe get one of the fancy ones for for even more. But you know, but the Roomba essentially does this. So you look. So if you look at the pattern that the Roomba has, it starts off in a spiral, you know, because it just, just wants to get sort of maximum clean using that. And then once it hits an object, it just bounces around randomly. Why would somebody do this? Why would why would you why would you have a robot that would that would work work in this way? Yeah. That's one thing it could do. I can tell you from experience, because I had one of these when my kids were were young. Um it does not do a great job of maximum coverage. <laughs> if I have, if I'm, if I'm inviting like somebody important to come over for dinner, that's this is not how I'm going to clean my floor. But if my kids are spilling Cheerios, sure, yeah. Um, you don't have to worry about any like spiraling. It'll eventually, hopefully, get what you want to get. Why would that be advan advantageous? Um, about like a. Uh, I like that robustness. We call that robustness. We had a hand up in the in the front. Oh, if you're trying to run a business, what would be one thing that you really want to think about when you're making these robot platforms? Right, and so what you have to think about cost. At the top of it, it's cheap. The reason why you can buy these robots for potentially $100 or $200 is because minimal computation on board. I don't have to run a big computer. I can make my algorithms really simple. And it's going to, and if I design my system really well, it's going to be robust enough and it's going to work in people's houses. But the problem is if we want to get maximum coverage, it's going to be slow. It's going to take a ton of time to actually clean the house, right? And so just moving around randomly can do a lot for you, but there are pros and cons. Does that make sense? Um, another approach is we could just follow the follow our wall to the goal, right? Um, any guesses on uh, on, on uh, if we wanted to follow if we wanted our if we wanted to just follow the wall to the goal, you know, maybe we could we could do that too. But let's let's just consider a simpler case. If we have a a robot that's in a start location, we want to get to a goal. What's uh what what's the simplest thing that we could do? And knowing that we know the relative location of the of the of the goal to the robot, what's the simplest thing? Yeah. What's that? No, 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 no time constraints. Simpler, simpler, simpler. <laughs> but I appreciate you speaking up. What's that? Distance. In the back. We heard this, we heard this before. What's what's the what's the right way to do this? Simplest way, best idea? Just go straight. So if we're considering time. And all of the, and, you know, and the simplest thing that we want to do, the closest point, closest way to get between two points is a straight line, right? So we can do that. And it will take the least amount of time. It'll be robust. But what happens if we encounter a goal on our way to the obstacle? What should our robot do now? Yeah. All right. So let's say we we follow we our robot followed along along the along the way. Oops, sorry. So if we if we do that, I'm sorry. If you uh if we do that wall following algorithm, then what we're what we're going to do if we implement our wall follower here, we're going to have what's called a bug algorithm. And so we're representing this as a state machine that we're seeing right here. So what's going to happen is we're going to move towards the goal in a straight line, and if there's no collision. We're gonna. We're going to. Uh, we're just gonna keep going until we until we reach the goal. But if we encounter a collision, which is given by this this uh, this line right here, this edge right here, then what we're gonna do is follow the wall, right? And we're gonna keep following the wall until we until we have no obstacle in our path. And at that point, we're gonna then move towards the goal in a straight line again. And that's our bug algorithm, right? Right, Justin. I think you were suggesting this. And so if we do this, what it's going to look, what, what our bug algorithm can look like is we're going to start by moving towards the goal so that we're going to be in the move towards goal state. Um, all right, this is a straight line. All right, um, we'll skip that one. <laughs> um, but if we start moving towards the goal, um, we're going to run into an obstacle, right? 
we're gonna we're and at that obstacle what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna drop what's called a hit point and we're gonna then from that hit point then then move then move around and we're gonna follow we're gonna keep following the wall until we find a straight line path to the goal until we, we have an unoccluded path to the goal at that point we're gonna draw a new straight line right and from that new straight line we're gonna start moving towards the goal again and that point that from which we leave that obstacle is, we're, is what we're gonna call to, is what we're gonna call a leave point once we do this, we're going to continue going until we hit another obstacle that could come in our way. And then, uh, and then we're going to wall follow again, dropping another hit point. And we're going to move around this obstacle until we have, uh, until we have a, another clear path to the goal. And once that's done, we will, we will drop what's called the leave point, just uh, something that we note, and then we can move towards the goal. And then we end when the goal is reached. Yeah, sure. Uh, a fast if you want a faster path that's project three <laughs> but if you want if you want to explore what it would look like if you if you if it went right instead of left what would it do I'm, i'd ask you well if it chose to go to go right instead of left what would happen Mm -hmm. let's say it goes right it goes right so it'll work in that case as well you know it may not be the shortest path may not be what we call an optimal path but it will get you to the goal right and it's relatively simple to do right i don't you know this we've i mean you've implemented your wall follower is it that complicated okay i i, I take that question back <laughs> all right um So uh, give me a, can I, can you get a, give me an idea of an algorithm that moves like a bug that we care about in the world that I might read news stories about? Yeah. The little Boston dynamics. The, the spot mini, the dog. the dog, you know what? The dog could do that, but I don't know if anybody cares about the dog just yet. Right. You know, I mean, are you going to lay $75,000 to buy, to buy a dog? You know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah, a, a, one of the one of the dog one of the robot dogs could do this. Actually, something that's that's serving a real purpose right now. Astro could do this as well. Um, I'm not not going to make any comments on that, but <laughs> Astro Astro could could do the to, could could do this for the home for domestic environments, right? I think it's it's still there's a lot of potential that that Astro has. Food delivery robot could do that, but are you willing to, to to wait for the robot to circumvent all? I mean, to to wall follow around buildings in the city to deliver your food? Yeah, a rover. That is what I had in mind. So, you, if you have your Mars rover, so let's say you you know you send a robot out to some new planet, right? You don't have a map of that planet. You might have a map of that planet, but you don't have a sense of all the things that are in the way. But you can figure out where this robot is, and you, if you wanted to go explore a particular area, you'd like to give it a goal. And so, uh, so one thing that we we should note is we have a, an excellent. So you've seen the the Mars yard over here on the side of the building. We have an excellent Mars rover team, and they and so this is something you can get a, be a part of as, in in terms of um, um, you can be a part of in your college experience. And so there's a number of things that that are advantageous to this. It's relatively simple. It's relatively reliable. You know what it's going to do. Your, you know, your wall follower can work in many different circumstances, um, but we, it, but we, but we have more computational requirements because we have to have a known goal location, which means we have to know where our robot currently is with respect to that goal. So we have to have either GPS or really good odometry, and our robot, because it's a wall follower, can be forgetful. It can, might make the same mistakes over and over and over again, and have not have the ability to adapt over time. And so one thing that I, I, would, uh, I would, I would, so I don't know if you know what the connection is between 
the Mar between between rovers on Mars and the and the uh, and the I and the, and the Roomba. Does anybody know what that that connection is? They both owe uh, a huge debt to my academic grandfather. Anybody know who my academic grandfather is? Any guesses? Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, my academic grandfather was faculty member at MIT. The guy named, oh yeah. Oh man, I wish, <laughs> not that I wish, but like, uh, but Klaus Shannon may be a little, a few generations separated from me. Um, but you know, but, but a Michigan alum, so, so good. Um, it, it's, it's a, so the founder of, I, one of the founder of iRobot Corporation, which makes the Roomba is a guy named Rodney Brooks. And before making iRobot, he made uh, with this Genghis Hexapod robot. And so this is so they both follow the similar sort of sort of philosophy that if you design your, the physical platform really well, that you that your robot can be robust to a number of different circumstances. So a lot of design goes into the to the Roomba to make it such that when when it turns around, it doesn't get caught on things, and it can spin in place without without getting into trouble. This Hexapod does did very similar things in that it could it doesn't have to build a full model of its world. It just has to know where it is, and it can it's designed to climb over stuff and be robust in that way. And so this this Genghis Hexapod that was developed at MIT, um, you know, was was sort of an inspiration, was a, uh, one of the founding points for for developing the Mars Exploration Rover. And so. You know, so if you want your robot to get to a to a particular location, you know, you may have uh, craters or other things that are in the way. But your but your robot, if it knows where it is, it can it can locally sense where it, where it has obstacles and do a and in the same way that you have a crater, we kind of do wall following around walls. The Mars Exploration Rover kind of does wall following, does does crater following on on along the edge of craters, and it does this by using a you know something a little bit more sophisticated than our, our laser range finding. It oftentimes uses things like 3D stereo to get a sense of what traverse, what areas, uh, what, what parts of the terrain it can traverse or not traverse. And so you just kind of get a sense here of like the robots building a 3D reconstruction nearby and the areas that are green that you can kind of see in the 3D map are areas that it's, it believes are safe to, for it to, to, to traverse over, for it to roll over. Uh, the areas in, in yellow are sort of like maybe, but not sure. And the areas in red are the ones that sort of like don't do that bad, right? And that's sort of the equivalent of the antenna for the, in the bug algorithm, it's sort of the, the equivalent of the, the antenna. And so again, Michigan has an excellent uh, rover student team. So if you want to join that, I would highly recommend it. We've had a number of great students come through who's taken classes with me who've come through through M Rover. Um, all right. So let's say that we we had our case right here. Let me add one more obstacle and you can tell me what happens. Um, so what if I add obstacle three here? What happens when uh, with what happens now with our bug algorithm um, when I add obstacle three? No, you can't answer. In the back. Like that? Yeah. What's the problem with that? It, sorry? Well, I wouldn't say it breaks the algorithm, but it will never end. We'll never reach the end state of our finite state machine, right? And so that's gonna be that's gonna be a problem. So what we're actually what we've actually described here is what we call the bug zero algorithm. So bug zero has this known known issue where where it may never where it may not terminate. Um, one thing we can do instead of using bug zero is we can use something. There's a number of bug algorithms. Instead, we could do we could do bug one. And so this is the finite state machine for for bug one. I I, I probably should not ask you to to read a finite state machine off the top of your head and and just tell me what would happen, but I'm gonna ask you. <laughs> here's a here's a finite state machine for 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 bug one, um, and uh, uh oh yeah. Um, and what do you think would happen if we if we executed this bug one algorithm? Justin, quick response here. Yeah. This is Use the fact that you better that section with the door to pick a new direction to go and we can become these other Right. Yes. I will say more, but I want to hear I want to hear more. Yeah. Yeah. 
sort of Oh, skinny, and you that over right right so that that's uh you know so that is that is uh that is what we're what we're seeing here and so if i traced out what the behavior would look like so what 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 this is going to do is it's doing exactly what, what both of you're saying so it's going to go it's going to hit obstacle one moving in that direction it's going to go completely around obstacle one and store the point that is closest to the goal and that's going to be the leave point. So it goes all the way around. And then the purple dot right there becomes the becomes the leave point, which is going to be the closest to the goal. From there it leaves and then it draw and it goes on the line straight to the to the to the um to the to the goal. As it's moving along that it is moving away from that first purple dot, it goes and it's going to hit obstacle two. It goes all the way around obstacles two, storing the closest point to the goal. And then it finds that closest point to the to the goal, leaves from there, and then it can then it can get to the goal. We never encounter obstacle three in this case, right? All right. Does bug one make sense? Well, even if it doesn't, you don't have to implement it for this project. So, <laughs> but if you want to do something something special for uh, as as an advanced extension, bug one is a great thing to try. Um, so it gets to this question, bug one versus bug zero. Should our robot fully think through a problem or react to quick changes in our, in, in, and just sort of respond quickly and effectively in a highly dynamic world? What should the robot do? Any guesses? I feel like robots have the ability to do both. The robots, the land says robots need the ability to do both. What do you think, Justin? Right. Um, well, I you, you avoided my trap because I think because because it is true, right? What we actually have are trade-offs between what we call deliberation and reaction, right? And so when we when we do what's called deliberation, what we have is typically a model that's called a sense plan act model. Um, and so what you're kind of doing with bug one is you're building a, a, as complete a model of the environment as you can. And based off of that, you're, you it essentially is planning out what's the next thing it can do to optimize its chances to get to the goal. Whereas if we have, uh, but in contrast, we have reactive architectures that can be cheaper to implement like our random walk or our, or our bug zero, which is going to just respond to just, you know, am I bumping into something or am I not? Am I, can I go to the goal or I'm not? But it's gonna be cheaper in some cases, it can be more robust, but it's going to be, but it can make mistakes and it can forget. So when we think about about this, uh, let me let me skip that. Um, if we want to then take the next step and say, you know, we got bug one, it's cool, but we want to then sort of go and like and actually have something that can generate a shortest path. What we're going to talk about for project three, and I'm probably Yana's going to not like me for talking about project three already, but one thing we could do. As we, as we, as, as our next step is, we could actually build a map to guide us, and so I just want to show our friend uh, the gerbil again. Um, and so after the gerbil went around that first time, it took a minute forty six seconds. Um, a few tries later, the gerbil got better, and so so we can see see how the gerbil behaves uh, performs now. Anybody have a gerbil for a pet? No, hamster. Can I say same difference? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry with that. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I mean, I, I will say that one thing I try to do with with uh, I don't know if you guys remember my cat, Katari twenty six hundred. Um, I often try to tr throw treats in tricky places for there he has to actually figure things out. Um, but it's becoming harder because he's mapped out our house. And so, so he's pretty good. So that time, that second time, the, the gerbil only took 50 seconds. And then when they tried it again, you know, the gerbil's like, all right, been here, done that. Uh, I know, I know what I'm doing because it's built a good map of its environment. And then bam, it's right there. So if we can start to, so, 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 um, so as we, so as the, as the, um, as the as, as the as the the, the um, as your robot, similar to the gerbil, goes around space, it can start to build up a map, start to use that to plan an optimal path to take the shortest route to the goal. And this is some something we sort of talked about uh, earlier on, and we'll talk about as we as we get into sort of the next lecture. 
um, you know, our robot can go around and build a map. So as our robot's going around and exploring, it can use its laser range finding, not just as an antenna, but it can use it to actually reason about what the area of space looks like. And so as our robot is reasoning about that space, we build a map, we're localizing that map, and we can start to generate algorithms that would allow us to, um, to, find, out the, to find us the most efficient route to get to the goal. And so once we build out that map, we can, uh, we can then do sort of what was, what was promised in the, in, the, in the beginning when people looked at, this, uh, looked at this project or were thinking about this class, that our robot could, uh, could autonomously navigate on its own, um, similar to our, to our friend the gerbil, and be able to get directly to the to the goal location, and so by the end of project three, you should be able to you should be able to do that. Um, but project two is our is our first step for making that happen, and so um, with with Yana's approval at some point, I'm gonna I'm going to uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna cover breath first search pathfinding. Um, I don't know when we're gonna do it, but we will. But we will cover it. I don't know if I'm gonna give it ahead of time or in synchronous synchronous mode, and then put the lecture online. I don't know if which would you like better. If you like 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 this format where I'm talking in class, or you like to just watch the video. Um, what's that? It's snap the snaps for what? For for you like this format better? Really? Yeah. All right. Cool. Cool. You know. I thought you I thought you'd prefer watching it at your house on 2x. I've watched watching some students watch, watch videos on 3x. I'm like, I don't know how you're getting anything from that, but um, but all right, but we'll we'll make the video available so you can choose what you like. Um so I'll give this I'll give this lecture and that'll be uh that'll be the next thing we we cover. Um and along with uh complimentary complimentary uh um material from Yana. And so with that, I'm gonna stop recording and I'm gonna stop this lecture. Thanks for listening. Um, where are you meeting controls? Escape, there we go. All right, thank you very much.